her work created uh, more time that she needed to require her to not be prepared. So in the last, uh, last couple of minutes, I'm filling her in. So I've asked many of you for your hymn possibilities. So during the worship, um, I'll be choosing some of those that you helped me choose today. And I will sing those. And with your masks on, I, today I'm going to give you permission to quietly sing along. Um, this will not be a good day for an audition, Sue Davison, just so you know. Um, but just keep that in mind. You are welcome to sing if you know them, and if you don't, I hope, hope your spirit's singing. A few things that you'll find in your orders of worship. Of course, we have the Souls for Jesus collection of shoes used and new. Um, Sojourner Family Peace Center. There's perishable, perishable foods. Uh, there are also mask kits that can be taken and um, made. Um, any other announcements you need are there in your order. And uh, it's good to have you with us this morning. And um, now I hope you enjoy a song uh, that I recently learned um, called Somebody Bigger Than You and I. among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, 
Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. Please join with me in prayer at this time. Loving God, open the eyes of our hearts. Calm our tired, weary, and fear-filled spirits so that we can remain open to all that you are, love, peace, and strength. In this spirit, let's now join together our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. from 1 Kings, we find the prophet Elijah on the run uh, from an angry Queen Jezebel in fear for his life. 
And she has done her most to draw people toward worshiping um, a false god. And Elijah has stood and spoken against this. And the queen makes clear to him that that she will end him. Um, So Elijah flees and then prays for God to take him, that he is worthless because all others have forsaken God and God's covenant. And he is alone and afraid. So Elijah has come to the mountain where Moses met with God, and this is where we begin in 1 Kings chapter 19. Listen for God's word. At that place, he came to a cave, and he he spent the night there, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. And he, God, said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, God speaks to the fugitive and fearful Elijah hiding in that cave, asking, what are you doing here? And that same question comes again after Elijah hears God in the silence, following the roar of wind powerful enough to split mountains and rocks and the roar of fire, and then a silence that draws him to the entrance of the cave. And now if I had read a little further in this reading that second, um, after the second question from God, Elijah will again complain that he is alone and in fear and that all others have abandoned God's covenant. And God's ultimate reply tells Elijah to come down away from the cave and, he, and speaks of a reckoning to come that sounds harsh to our Ears, giving an image of a, a less than merciful God until the final words of God that basically tell Elijah that he is not alone and that he will find that many others are with him. And we will hear God speak in a different way through our next reading. So as we approach our reading from Matthew's Gospel, to, to frame it, Jesus has attempted to get away to pray, but responds to the pressing needs of the multitude around him. And he, with his disciples surrounding him, offer the multitude what they need and more. And it is this miraculous story of loaves and fishes that is happening. And it is from here that our lesson this morning begins in Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 to 33. So again, listen for God's word. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, 
it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, starting to walk on the water, and he came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. May we be blessed with some understanding um, through the reading of this word. Amen. Fear not, do not be afraid. Some version of this is in the Bible more than any other statement. Yet we do find ourselves afraid at times. Some fear the unknown, some fear indecision, some fear choices that others make and some fear their rights being taken away, while others fear that they will never achieve the same as others. Some of our fears seem rational and wise, or at least of good purpose, that lead to good decisions, while other fears become, well, larger than life, squeezing life out. And now I am going to make a confession. I don't really like elevators. No matter what 
My logical brain or faith-filled heart reassures me about them. There are spaces in time when I can ride those little enclosed boxes that move between floors with little thought. And yet other times, I walk up five, six, seven flights of stairs congratulating myself on the healthier choice, huffing and puffing my way past anxiety. And for some reason, my logical brain and faith-filled heart has little sway in those moments. And you can think of me what you wish. Believe me, it is my desire to be a consistent tower of strength and God-filled purpose. But I offer myself up here noting that I had some years until recently where I felt that I had conquered the elevator. And I even congratulated myself for trusting God in the world around me more. And yet lately, I find myself defaulting to the healthy choice of climbing stairs, which is not bad, um, except that this is because I'm not comfortable stepping in and letting those doors close. And I've reflected on this, considering the general anxiety and frustration that I believe that most of us are feeling and the potential that it has to grow louder than hope and peace of mind and treating each other with compassion. And in our lesson this morning, we find Jesus alone on the mountain praying, yet somehow he sees the disciple-filled boat in the distance floundering, struggling against the wind through that long night. And all of them, especially the fishermen who knew that lake, had to be exhausted, straining against what they couldn't control and perhaps beginning to fear um, that the wind would never end, possibly taking them down, when there is that strange image of something coming toward them. It couldn't be a someone, because no, that, that had to be fatigue creating more fear. And like Peter and the disciples, Elijah, must have been exhausted with fear. Wind rushing, mountains splitting, earthquake, fire, and then silence. And as I read these two stories side by side, I wondered if the take heart, do not be afraid, followed by why did you doubt, carried a similar tone to the question Elijah heard twice. What are you doing here? First in the storm, and then in the stillness, caught in fear. And perhaps these questions didn't sound quite like a there, there, calm down response, and perhaps it didn't carry a tone of rebuke for lack of faith, but maybe it sounded something in between. A, what are you doing here, floundering as if you are alone? Take heart. We may all be able to look back on a situation and, and wonder at the time, why did I doubt in that moment? But we know that fear clouds our ability to see and hear in the moment. Mountains splitting, wind, earthquake disruptions, fire, stormy seas, and a, a vision of salvation we simply do not see for what it is. 
We can find correlations to all of these as metaphors or very real things in our individual circumstance and in our communal circumstance. But yes, fear clouds our ability to see and hear at times. And really, for many, faith is not a light switch that we can automatically turn on or off, for that matter. Fear not. It's no surprise that this is the most oft used phrase in the Bible. And we hang on to 1 John's perfect love casts out fear and put it on post-it notes um, on our bathroom mirrors and on top of our laptop screens to remind us. But the fact that we can read or hear this so often is not a chastisement to our little faith. For we must remember God's penchant for mercy that supersedes whatever opinions we might have for how we or others could just manage things better. And as one author said, we remind ourselves of God's grace lest we receive the gospel primarily as good advice rather than good news. There is a distinction between good news and good good advice. Good advice is something that we offer each other, whether we receive it or give it as well-intentioned, Um, But the good news is what God offers us. And it will never be wrong. God is unwaveringly faithful through physical and spiritual storms, earthquakes, deafening, mountain, splitting upheaval, silence, or that still, small voice through the hand that reaches out to us when we are going under. But part of our struggle is that we don't have Jesus standing in the storm outside the boat in front of us. But then we remember that's what we are called to do and be, to offer our hand to another. And when we're not sure which hand to grab when it is us who are sinking, well, from what we know of Jesus, that hand being offered will be one without judgment. It will be offered for mercy's sake. And we may be surprised by who that comes from. Or we might see Jesus' hand reaching out to us through the Winnie the Poohs in our lives that A.A. Milne gives us in his stories, creating an image as he writes, Piglet sidled up to Pooh from behind. Pooh, he whispered. Yes, Piglet. Nothing, said Piglet, taking Pooh's hand. I just wanted to be sure of you. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter starts out into the water, having heard the invitation to come. And yet we know what happens next. We do not know how long Peter stayed above water before the storm and fear took hold? Probably because Peter's tenacity of faith, be it sheer recklessness or as an admirable risk, may not be the point. Or at least that's not how this seemed to speak this week. This week, listening again to this text, 
It also wasn't Peter's fear-inspired failure that seemed the point. It was the next thing after that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't really want to let Peter or us off the hook completely. I mean, after all, like Peter, we may too often decide to trust God with our bargains when our heart says, God, if it's you, it, show me that you care for me, and then I will trust you to fix it. And then let our frustrations and fear scratch at and erode our trust in God. When things are difficult or uncomfortable or not going our way. But we're in good company with Peter when we find at times that we are having a hard time hanging on to trust and hope, when we are sinking and we feel that God's good news is slipping away from the world. And we might then focus on Peter as good advice for what not to do. I mean, by all means, do not step out unless you are sure that it is God inviting you. Or do not step out in faith unless you are sure that you can keep your eyes and focus on Jesus. No distractions. Do not show your fear or vulnerability because you will be judged as broken or lacking faith. No, that sounds like our voices giving advice, not God's. I know this is purely speculation, but have you ever wondered what those other disciples in the boat were saying as Peter first called out and then stepped out? Maybe it wasn't only the wind, but some good advice being shouted at him by others. So yes, Peter stepped out, and at some point he starts to sink. But when we, happen, when we focus on what happens after that, that is where we find the good news, that hand that reaches out to pull Peter up to pull us up. God's hand will not stop reaching, even when nailed to the cross, because that is not the end of our story. So take heart. When we feel at the end of patience with others, or, or even ourselves, at the end of our ability to be compassionate, at the end of our ability to extend or receive mercy, we might remember that mercy is something we might trip over at times, but God doesn't. And that's the God we follow. Fear not, it is I. Don't be afraid. This is spoken through the Bible, to us, through history and all circumstances. And it is God's continuing reminder that draws us back again and again to a place of living, to a place where anxiety and fear do not have power over us from loving each other and carrying full regard for that which hurts or diminishes another. And when we find that we are struggling with little faith, remember, it's not a matter of if we think we or others are not good enough or strong enough or patient enough or honorable enough. For there is a hand that is, and it is offered to us. So take heart. Amen.
from the collection of music uh, composed and created by the St. Louis Jesuits, Be Not Afraid. As we gather ourselves around prayer and our offering in that way to God, um, I, I ask if there are any prayers or concerns or joys that any of you would like to share. Julie, a mm -hmm. prayer for a former student and friend who was involved in an accident. His name is Tommy. Tommy? Tommy. He's in the hospital recovering. Thank you. Uh, did you hear that? Oh, okay. Let's pray. Gracious God, we believe. 
believe that it is your desire that we live fully each day through our actions, our care, our communications with each other and our rest. And yet we know and experience that life includes times of struggle and doubt, where peace and well-being, division and coming together are all a part of our lives. And we're grateful to open ourselves to you and to be encouraged to receive your hand guiding us through troubled times in your mercy and care. And we ask that you help us to find joy and gladness in each other, even as we are reminded of the things that hurt and hold others down and offer those up to you. And so trusting you and believing that you know our thoughts and our circumstances perhaps better than we do, we pray for those who are confused or lost, feeling without, that there may be a coming together within. And for those who do not feel you in their life, we do pray that that this can be tangible and known to them. Lord, for too many struggling with physical, spiritual, mental illness and fatigue, uh, suffering from accidents or uh, treatments, for cancer or concerns um, of what we do not know. Ease all of these broken places within and without. And when the world is just too loud, help us to find that stillness, yet when Quiet feels like loneliness. May that be filled with you. And when we are called to be your hand to each other, reaching out, when we see another struggle or when we don't, help us to know um, where you would have us act and where you would have us pray, and who you would have us be. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I offer you a benediction that Paul writes in the book to the Roman, or the letter to the Roman church. Receive this benediction. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Diversity 